Section 22 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. On the Custom of Kissing Hands. Monsieur Morin, a French academician, has amused himself with collecting several historical notices of this custom. I give a summary for the benefit of those who have had the honor of kissing His Majesty's hand. It is not those who kiss the royal hand who could write best on the custom. This custom is not only very ancient and nearly universal, but has been alike participated by religion and society. To begin with religion, from the remotest times men saluted the sun, moon, and stars by kissing the hand. Job assures us that he was never given to this superstition. 31. 26. The same honor was rendered to Baal, 1 Kings, 19. 18. Other instances might be adduced. We now pass to Greece. There all foreign superstitions were received. Lucian, after having mentioned various sorts of sacrifices which the rich offered the gods, adds that the poor adored them by the simpler compliment of kissing their hands. That author gives an anecdote of Demosthenes which shows this custom. When a prisoner to the soldiers of Antipater, he asked to enter a temple. When he entered, he touched his mouth with his hands, which the guards took for an act of religion. He did it, however, more securely to swallow the poison he had prepared for such an occasion. He mentions other instances. From the Greeks it passed to the Romans. Pliny places it among those ancient customs of which they were ignorant of the origin or the reason. Persons were treated as atheists who would not kiss their hands when they entered a temple. When Apuleius mentions Psyche, he says she was so beautiful that they adored her as Venus, in kissing the right hand. The ceremonial action rendered respectable the earliest institutions of Christianity. It was a custom with the primeval bishops to give their hands to be kissed by the ministers who served at the altar. This custom, however, as a religious rite, declined with paganism. In society, our ingenious academician considers the custom of kissing hands as essential to its welfare. It is a mute form which expresses reconciliation, which entreats favors, or which thanks for those received. It is a universal language, intelligible without an interpreter, which doubtless preceded writing, and perhaps speech itself. Solomon says of the flatterers and suppliants of his time that they ceased not to kiss the hands of their patrons till they had obtained the favors which they solicited. In Homer we see Priam kissing the hands and embracing the knees of Achilles while he supplicates for the body of Hector. This custom prevailed in ancient Rome, but it varied. In the first ages of the Republic it seems to have been only practiced by inferiors to their superiors. Equals gave their hands and embraced. In the progress of time even the soldiers refused to show this mark of respect to their generals, and their kissing the hand of Cato when he was obliged to quit them was regarded as an extraordinary circumstance at a period of such refinement. The great respect paid to the tribunes, councils, and dictators obliged individuals to live with them in a more distant and respectful manner, and instead of embracing them as they did formerly, they considered themselves as fortunate if allowed to kiss their hands. Under the emperors, kissing hands became an essential duty, even for the great themselves. Inferior courtiers were obliged to be content to adore the purple by kneeling, touching the robe of the emperor by the right hand, and carrying it to the mouth. Even this was thought too free, and at length they saluted the emperor at a distance by kissing their hands in the same manner as when they adored their gods. It is superfluous to trace this custom in every country where it exists. It is practice in every known country in respect to sovereigns and superiors, even amongst the Negroes and the inhabitants of the New World. Cortes found it established at Mexico, where more than a thousand lords saluted him in touching the earth with their hands, which they afterwards carried to their mouths. Thus, 
whether the custom of salutation is practiced by kissing the hands of others from respect or in bringing one's own to the mouth it is of all other customs the most universal this practice is now become too gross a familiarity and it is considered as a meanness to kiss the hand of those with whom we are in habits of intercourse and this custom would be entirely lost if lovers were not solicitous to preserve it in all its full power End of section 22section 23 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jason in panama curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli popes valois observes that the popes scrupulously followed in the early ages of the church the custom of placing their names after that of the person whom they addressed in their letters this mark of their humility he proves by letters written by various popes thus when the great projects of politics were yet unknown to them did they adhere to christian meekness at length the day arrived when one of the popes whose name does not occur to me said that it was safer to quarrel with a prince than with a friar henry the sixth being at the feet of pope celestine his holiness thought proper to kick the crown off his head which ludicrous and disgraceful action baronius has highly praised jortin observes on this great cardinal and advocate of the roman see that he breathes nothing but fire and brimstone and accounts kings and emperors to be mere catchpoles and constables bound to execute with implicit faith all the commands of insolent ecclesiastics bellarmin was made a cardinal for his efforts and devotion to the papal cause and maintaining this monstrous paradox that if the pope forbid the exercise of virtue and command that of a vice the roman church under pain of a sin was obliged to abandon virtue for vice if it would not sin against conscience it was nicholas i a bold and enterprising pope who in eight fifty eight forgetting the pious modesty of his predecessors took advantage of the divisions in the royal families of france and did not hesitate to place his name before that of the kings and emperors of the house of france to whom he wrote since that time he has been imitated by all his successors and this encroachment on the honours of monarchy has passed into a custom from having been tolerated in its commencement concerning the acknowledged infallibility of the popes it appears that gregory the seventh in council decreed that the church of rome neither had erred and never should err it was thus this prerogative of his holiness became received till thirteen thirteen when john twenty second abrogated decrees made by three popes his predecessors and declared that what was done amiss by one pope or council might be corrected by another and gregory eleventh thirteen seventy in his will deprecates si quid in catholica fide ereset the university of vienna protested against it calling it a contempt of god and an idolatry if any one in matters of faith should appeal from a council to the pope that is from god who presides in councils to man but the infallibility was at length established by leo x especially after luther's opposition because they despaired of defending their indulgences bulls etc by any other method imagination cannot form a scene more terrific than when these men were at the height of power and to serve their political purposes hurled the thunders of their excommunications over a kingdom it was a national distress not inferior to a plague or famine philip augustus desirous of divorcing ingelberg to unite himself to agnes de Marani, the pope put his kingdom under an interdict the churches were shut during the space of eight months they said neither mass nor vespers they did not marry and even the offspring of the married born at this unhappy period were considered as illicit and because the king would not sleep with his wife it was not permitted to any of his subjects to sleep with theirs in that year france was threatened with an extinction of the ordinary generation 
a man under this curse of public penance was divested of all his functions civil military and matrimonial he was not allowed to dress his hair to shave to bathe or even change his linen so that upon the whole this made a filthy penitent the good king robert incurred the censures of the church for having married his cousin he was immediately abandoned two faithful domestics alone remained with him and these always passed through the fire whatever he touched in a word the horror which an excommunication occasioned was such that a courtesan with whom one pelletier had passed some moments having learnt soon afterwards that he had been about six months an excommunicated person fell into a panic and with great difficulty recovered from her convulsions end of section twenty three Section 24 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Literary Composition. To literary composition, we may apply the saying of an ancient philosopher a little thing gives perfection although perfection is not a little thing the great legislator of the hebrews orders us to pull off the fruit for the first three years and not to taste them he was not ignorant how it weakens a young tree to bring to maturity its first fruits thus on literary compositions our green essays ought to be picked away the word zamar by a beautiful metaphor from pruning trees means in hebrew to compose verses blotting and correcting was so much churchill's abhorrence that i've heard from his publisher he once energetically expressed himself that it was like cutting away one's own flesh this strong figure sufficiently shows his repugnance to an author's duty churchill now lies neglected for posterity will only respect those who file off the mortal part of glowing thought with attic art young i have heard that this careless bard after a successful work usually precipitated the publication of another relying on its crudeness being passed over by the public curiosity excited by its better brother he called this getting double pay for thus he secured the sale of a hurried work but churchill was a spendthrift of fame and enjoyed all his revenue while he lived posterity owes him little and pays him nothing bale an experienced observer in literary matters tells us that correction is by no means practicable by some authors as in the case of ovid in exile his compositions were nothing more than spiritless repetitions of what he had formerly written he confesses both negligence and idleness in the corrections of his works the vivacity which animated his first productions failing him when he revised his poems he found correction too laborious and he abandoned it this however was only an excuse it is certain that some authors cannot correct they compose with pleasure and with ardour but they exhaust all their force they fly with but one wing when they review their works the first fire does not return there is in their imagination a certain calm which hinders their pen from making any progress their mind is like a boat which only advances by the strength of oars dr moore the platonist had such an exuberance of fancy that correction was a much greater labour than composition he used to say that in writing his works he was forced to cut his way through a crowd of thoughts as through a wood and that he threw off in his compositions as much as would make an ordinary philosopher moore was a great enthusiast and of course an egotist so that criticism ruffled his temper notwithstanding all his platonism when accused of obscurities and extravagances he said that like the ostrich he laid his eggs in the sands which would prove vital and prolific in time however these ostrich eggs have proved to be addled 
a habit of correctness in the lesser parts of composition will assist the higher it is worth recording that the great milton was anxious for correct punctuation and that addison was solicitous after the minutiae of the press savage armstrong and others felt tortures on similar objects it is said of julius scaliger that he had this peculiarity in his manner of composition he wrote with such accuracy that his manuscripts and the printed copy corresponded page for page and line for line malherbe the father of french poetry tormented himself by a prodigious slowness and was employed rather in perfecting than in forming works his muse is compared to a fine woman in the pangs of delivery he exulted in his tardiness and after finishing a poem of one hundred verses or a discourse of ten pages he used to say he ought to repose for ten years balzac the first writer in french prose who gave majesty and harmony to a period did not grudge to expend a week on a page never satisfied with his first thoughts our costive gray entertained the same notion and it is hard to say if it arose from the sterility of their genius or their sensibility of taste the manuscripts of tasso still preserved are illegible from the vast number of their corrections i have given a facsimile as correct as it is possible to conceive of one page of pope's manuscript homer as a specimen of his continual corrections and critical erasures the celebrated madame dacier never could satisfy herself in translating homer continually retouching the version even in its happiest passages there were several parts which she translated in six or seven manners and she frequently noted in the margin i have not yet done it when pascal became warm in his celebrated controversy he applied himself with incredible labour to the composition of his provincial letters he was frequently twenty days occupied on a single letter he recommenced some above seven and eight times and by this means obtained that perfection which has made his work as voltaire says one of the best books ever published in france the quintus courteous of vogelus occupied him thirty years generally every period was translated in the margin five or six different ways chapelain and conrart who took the pains to review this work critically were many times perplexed in their choice of passages they generally liked best that which had been first composed hume had never done with corrections every edition varies from the preceding ones but there are more fortunate and fluid minds than these voltaire tells us of fenelon's telemachus that the amiable author composed it in his retirement in the short period of three months fenelon had before this formed his style and his mind overflowed with all the spirit of the ancients he opened a copious fountain and there were not ten erasures in the original manuscript the same facility accompanied gibbon after the experience of his first volume and the same copious readiness attended adam smith who dictated to his amanuensis while he walked about his study the ancients were as pertinacious in their corrections isocrates it is said was employed for ten years on one of his works and to appear natural studied with the most refined art after a labour of eleven years virgil pronounced his aeneid imperfect dio cassius devoted twelve years to the composition of his history and diodorus siculus thirty there is a middle between velocity and torpidity the italians say it is not necessary to be a stag but we ought not to be a tortoise many ingenious expedients are not to be contemned in literary labours the critical advice to choose an author as we would a friend is very useful to young writers the finest geniuses have always affectionately attached themselves to some particular author of congenial disposition pope in his version of homer kept a constant eye on his master dryden corneille's favourite authors were the brilliant tacitus the heroic livy and the lofty lucin the influence of their characters may be traced in his best tragedies the great clarendon when employed in writing his history read over very carefully tacitus and livy to give dignity to his style 
tacitus did not surpass him in his portraits though clarendon never equalled livy in his narrative the mode of literary composition adopted by that admirable student sir william jones is well deserving our attention after having fixed on his subjects he always added the model of the composition and thus boldly wrestled with the great authors of antiquity on board the frigate which was carrying him to india he projected the following works and noted them in this manner one elements of the laws of england model the essay on bailments aristotle two the history of the american war model thucydides and polybius three britain discovered an epic poem machinery hindu gods model homer four speeches political and forensic model demosthenes five dialogues philosophical and historical model plato and of favourite authors there are also favourite works which we love to be familiarised with bartholinus has a dissertation on reading books in which he points out the superior performances of different writers of st austin his city of god of hippocrates coacae praenotiones of cicero de officius of aristotle de animalibus of catullus coma berenices of virgil the sixth book of the aeneid etc such judgments are indeed not to be our guides but such a mode of reading is useful by condensing our studies evelyn who has written treatises on several subjects was occupied for years on them his manner of arranging his materials and his mode of composition appear excellent having chosen a subject he analyzed it into its various parts under certain heads or titles to be filled up at leisure under these heads he set down his own thoughts as they occurred occasionally inserting whatever was useful from his reading when his collections were thus formed he digested his own thoughts regularly and strengthened them by authorities from ancient and modern authors or alleged his reasons for dissenting from them his collections in time became voluminous but he then exercised that judgment which the formers of such collections are usually deficient in with hesiod he knew that half is better than the whole and it was his aim to express the quintessence of his reading but not to give it in a crude state to the world and when his treatises were sent to the press they were not half the size of his collections thus also winkelmann in his history of art an extensive work was long lost in settling on a plan like artists who make random sketches of their first conceptions he threw on paper ideas hints and observations which occurred in his readings many of them indeed were not connected with his history but were afterwards inserted in some of his other works even gibbon tells us of his roman history at the outset all was dark and doubtful even the title of the work the true era of the decline and fall of the empire the limits of the introduction the division of the chapters and the order of the narration and i was often tempted to cast away the labour of seven years akenside has exquisitely described the progress and the pains of genius in its delightful reveries pleasures of imagination book three verse three seventy three the pleasures of composition in an ardent genius were never so finely described as by buffon speaking of the hours of composition he said these are the most luxurious and delightful moments of life moments which have often enticed me to pass fourteen hours at my desk in a state of transport this gratification more than glory is my reward the publication of gibbon's memoirs conveyed to the world a faithful picture of the most fervid industry it is in youth the foundations of such a sublime edifice as his history must be laid the world can now trace how this colossus of erudition day by day and year by year prepared himself for some vast work gibbon has furnished a new idea in the art of reading we ought says he not to attend to the order of our books so much as of our thoughts the perusal of a particular work gives birth perhaps to ideas unconnected with the subject it treats i pursue these ideas and quit my proposed plan of reading thus in the midst of homer he read longinus a chapter of longinus led to an epistle of pliny 
and having finished longinus he followed the train of his ideas of the sublime and beautiful in the inquiry of burke and concluded with comparing the ancient with the modern longinus of all our popular writers the most experienced reader was given and he offers an important advice to an author engaged on a particular subject i suspended my perusal of any new book on the subject till i had reviewed all that i knew or believed or had thought on it that i might be qualified to discern how much the authors added to my original stock these are valuable hints to students and such have been practised by others footnote edgar poe's account of the regular mode by which he designed and executed his best and most renowned poem the raven is an instance of the use of methodical rule successfully applied to what appears to be one of the most fanciful of mental works End of footnote anselon was a very ingenious student he seldom read a book throughout without reading in his progress many others his library table was always covered with a number of books for the most part open this variety of authors bred no confusion they all assisted to throw light on the same topic he was not disgusted by frequently seeing the same thing in different writers their opinions were so many new strokes which completed the ideas which he had conceived the celebrated father paul studied in the same manner he never passed over an interesting subject till he had confronted a variety of authors in historical researches he never would advance till he had fixed once for all the places time and opinions a mode of study which appears very dilatory but in the end will make a great saving of time and labour of mind those who have not pursued this method are all their lives at a loss to settle their opinions and their belief from the want of having once brought them to such a test i shall now offer a plan of historical study and a calculation of the necessary time it will occupy without specifying the authors as i only propose to animate a young student who feels he has not to number the days of a patriarch that he should not be alarmed at the vast labyrinth historical researches present to his eye if we look into public libraries more than thirty thousand volumes of history may be found Longlet de fresnois one of the greatest readers calculated that he could not read with satisfaction more than ten hours a day and ten pages in folio an hour which makes one hundred pages every day supposing each volume to contain one thousand pages every month would amount to three volumes which make thirty-six volumes in folio in the year in fifty years a student could only read eighteen hundred volumes in folio all this too supposing uninterrupted health and an intelligence as rapid as the eyes of the laborious researcher a man can hardly study to advantage till past twenty and at fifty his eyes will be dimmed and his head stuffed with much reading that should never be read his fifty years for eighteen hundred volumes are reduced to thirty years and one thousand volumes and after all the universal historian must resolutely face thirty thousand volumes but to cheer the historiographer he shows that a public library is only necessary to be consulted it is in our private closet where should be found those few writers who direct us to their rivals without jealousy and mark in the vast career of time those who are worthy to instruct posterity his calculation proceeds on this plan that six hours a day and the term of ten years are sufficient to pass over with utility the immense field of history he calculates an alarming extent of historical ground for a knowledge of sacred history he gives three months ancient egypt babylon and assyria modern assyria or persia one ditto greek history six ditto roman history by the moderns seven ditto roman history by the original writers six ditto ecclesiastical history general and particular thirty ditto modern history twenty four ditto to this may be added for recurrences and reperusals forty eight ditto the total will amount to ten and a half years thus in ten years and a half 
a student in history has obtained an universal knowledge and this on a plan which permits as much leisure as every student would choose to indulge as a specimen of du fresnoir's calculations take that of sacred history for reading pere calmet's learned dissertations in the order he points out twelve days for pere calmet's history in two volumes quarto now in four twelve for Prideaux's history ten for josephus twelve for basnage's history of the jews twenty in all sixty-six days he allows however ninety days for obtaining a sufficient knowledge of sacred history in reading this sketch we are scarcely surprised at the erudition of a gibbon but having admired that erudition we perceive the necessity of such a plan if we would not learn what we have afterwards to unlearn a plan like the present even in a mind which should feel itself incapable of the exertion will not be regarded without that reverence we feel for genius animating such industry this scheme of study though it may never be rigidly pursued will be found excellent ten years labour of happy diligence may render a student capable of consigning to posterity a history as universal in its topics as that of the historian who led to this investigation end of literary composition Section 25 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Poetical Imitations and Similarities. Tantus amor florum et generandi gloria melis georgica liber four verse two hundred and four such rage of honey in our bosom beats and such a zeal we have for flowery sweets dryden this article was commenced by me many years ago in the early volumes of the monthly magazine and continued by various correspondents with various success i have collected only those of my own contribution because i do not feel authorized to make use of those of other persons however some may be desirable one of the most elegant of literary recreations is that of tracing poetical or prose imitations and similarities for assuredly similarity is not always imitation bishop hurd's pleasing essay on the marks of imitation will assist the critic in deciding on what may only be an accidental similarity rather than a studied imitation those critics have indulged an intemperate abuse in these entertaining researches who from a single word derived the imitation of an entire passage wakefield in his edition of gray is very liable to this censure this kind of literary amusement is not despicable there are few men of letters who have not been in the habit of marking parallel passages or tracing imitation in the thousand shapes it assumes it forms it cultivates it delights taste to observe by what dexterity and variation genius conceals or modifies an original thought or image and to view the same sentiment or expression borrowed with art or heightened by embellishment the ingenious writer of a criticism on gray's elegy in continuation of dr johnson's has given some observation on this subject which will please it is often entertaining to trace imitation to detect the adopted image the copied design the transferred sentiment the appropriate phrase and even the acquired manner and frame under all the disguises that imitation combination and accommodation may have thrown around them must require both parts and diligence but it will bring with it no ordinary gratification a book professedly on the history and progress of imitation in poetry written by a man of perspicuity an adept in the art of discerning likenesses even when minute with examples properly selected and gradations duly marked would make an impartial accession to the store of human literature and furnish rational curiosity with a high regale let me premise that these notices the wrecks of a large collection of passages i had once formed merely as exercises to form my taste are not given with the petty malignant delight of detecting the unacknowledged imitations of our best writers 
but merely to habituate the young student to an instructive amusement and to exhibit that beautiful variety which the same image is capable of exhibiting when retouched with all the art of genius gray in his ode to spring has the attic warbler pours her throat wakefield in his commentary has a copious passage on this poetical diction he conceives it to be an admirable improvement of the greek and roman classics Cain auden hesiod scutum herculis three hundred ninety six suaves ex ore loquelas funde lucretius one forty this learned editor was little conversant with modern literature as he proved by his memorable editions of gray and pope the expression is evidently borrowed not from hesiod nor from lucretius but from a brother at home is it for thee the linnet pours her throat essay on man epistola three verse thirty three gray in the ode to adversity addresses the power thus thou tamer of the human breast whose iron scourge and torturing hour the bad affright afflict the best wakefield censures the expression torturing hour by discovering an impropriety and incongruity he says consistency of figure rather required some material image like iron scourge and adamantine chain it is curious to observe a verbal critic lecture such a poet as gray the poet probably would never have replied or in a moment of excessive urbanity he might have condescended to point out to this minutest of critics the following passage in milton when the scourge inexorably and the torturing hour calls us to penance paradise lost b two verse ninety gray in his ode to adversity has light they disperse and with them go the summer friend fond of this image he has it again in his bard they swarm that in thy noontide beam are born gone perhaps the germ of this beautiful image may be found in shakespeare for men like butterflies show not their mealy wings but to the summer troilus and cressida act three scene seven and two similar passages in timon of athens the swallow follows not summer more willingly than we your lordship timon no more willingly leaves winter such summer birds are men act three again in the same one cloud of winter showers these flies are couched act two gray in his progress of poetry has in climbs beyond the solar road wakefield has traced this imitation to dryden gray himself refers to virgil and petrarch wakefield gives the line from dryden thus beyond the year and out of heaven's highway which he calls extremely bold and poetical i confess a critic might be allowed to be somewhat fastidious in this unpoetical diction on the highway which i believe dryden never used i think his line was thus beyond the year out of the solar walk pope has expressed the image more elegantly though copied from dryden far as the solar walk or milky way gray has in his bard dear as the light that visits these sad eyes dear as the ruddy drops that warm my heart gray himself points out the imitation in shakespeare of the latter image but it is curious to observe that otway in his venice preserved makes priuli most pathetically exclaim to his daughter that she is dear as the vital warmth that feeds my life dear as these eyes that weep in fondness over thee gray tells us that the image of his bard loose his beard and hoary hair streamed like a meteor to the troubled air was taken from a picture of the supreme being by raphael it is however remarkable and somewhat ludicrous that the beard of hudibras is also compared to a meteor and the accompanying observation of butler almost induces one to think that gray derived from it the whole plan of that sublime ode since his bard precisely performs what the beard of hudibras denounced these are the verses this hairy meteor did denounce the fall of sceptres and of crowns hudibras canto one i have been asked if i am serious in my conjecture that the meteor beard of hudibras might have given birth to the bard of gray i reply that the burlesque and the sublime are extremes and extremes meet how often does it merely depend on our own state of mind and on our own taste to consider the sublime as burlesque 
a very vulgar but acute genius thomas paine whom we may suppose destitute of all delicacy and refinement has conveyed to us a notion of the sublime as it is probably experienced by ordinary and uncultivated minds and even by acute and judicious ones who are destitute of imagination he tells us that the sublime and the ridiculous are often so nearly related that it is difficult to class them separately one step above the sublime makes the ridiculous and one step above the ridiculous makes the sublime again may i venture to illustrate this opinion would it not appear the ridiculous or burlesque to describe the sublime revolution of the earth on her axle round the sun by comparing it with the action of a top flogged by a boy and yet some of the most exquisite lines in milton do this the poet only alluding in his mind to the top the earth he describes whether she from west her silent course advance with inoffensive pace that spinning sleeps on her soft axle while she paces even be this as it may it has never i believe been remarked to return to gray that when he conceived the idea of the beard of his bard he had in his mind the language of milton who describes azazel sublimely unfurling the imperial ensign which full high advanced shone like a meteor streaming to the wind paradise lost b one verse five hundred thirty five very similar to gray's streamed like a meteor to the troubled air gray has been severely censured by johnson for the expression give ample room and verge enough the characters of hell to trace the bard on the authority of the most unpoetical of critics we must still hear that the poet has no line so bad ample room is feeble but would have passed unobserved in any other poem but in the poetry of gray who has taught us to admit nothing but what is exquisite verge enough is poetical since it conveys a material image to the imagination no one appears to have detected the source from whence probably the whole line was derived i am inclined to think it was from the following passage in dryden let fortune empty her whole quiver on me i have a soul that like an ample shield can take in all and verge enough for more dryden's don sebastian gray in his elegy has even in our ashes live their wonted fires this line is so obscure that it is difficult to apply it to what precedes it mason in his edition in vain attempts to derive it from a thought of petrarch and still more vainly attempts to amend it wakefield expends an octavo page to paraphrase this single verse from the following lines of chaucer one would imagine gray caught the recollected idea the old reeve in his prologue says of himself and of old men for one we may not dawn than always bacon yet in our ashen cold is fire ereken terwitz chaucer volume one page one hundred fifty three verse three thousand eight hundred seventy nine gray has a very expressive word highly poetical but i think not common for who to dumb forgetfulness a prey daniel has as quoted in cooper's muses library and in himself with sorrow does complain the misery of dark forgetfulness a line of popes in his dunciad high-born howard echoed in the ear of gray when he gave with all the artifice of alliteration high-born howell's harp johnson bitterly censures gray for giving to adjectives the termination of participles such as the cultured plain the daisied bank but he solemnly adds i was sorry to see in the line of a scholar like gray the honeyed spring had johnson received but the faintest tincture of the rich italian school of english poetry he would never have formed so tasteless a criticism honeyed is employed by milton in more places than one hide me from day's garish eye while the bee with honeyed thigh penseroso verse one hundred forty two the celebrated stanza in gray's elegy seems partly to be borrowed full many a gem of purest ray serene the dark unfathomed eaves of ocean bear full many a flower is torn to blush unseen and waste its sweetness in the desert air pope had said they're kept by charms concealed from mortal eye like roses that in deserts bloom and die rape of the lock young says of nature in distant wilds by human eye unseen she rears her flowers and spreads her velvet green 
pure gurgling rills the lonely desert trace and waste their music on the savage race and shenstone has and like the desert's lily bloom to fade elegy four gray was so fond of this pleasing imagery that he repeats it in his ode to the installation and mason echoes it in his ode to memory milton thus paints the evening sun if chance the radiant sun with farewell sweet extends his evening beam the fields revive the birds their notes renew etc paradise lost b two verse four hundred ninety two can there be a doubt that he borrowed this beautiful farewell from an obscure poet quoted by poole in his english parnassus sixteen fifty seven the date of milton's great work i find since admits the conjecture the first edition being that of sixteen sixty nine the homely lines in poole are these to thetis watery bowers the sun doth high bidding farewell unto the gloomy sky young in his love of fame very adroitly improves on a witty conceit of butler it is curious to observe that while butler had made a remote allusion of a window to a pillory a conceit is grafted on this conceit with even more exquisite wit each window like the pillory appears with heads thrust through nailed by the ears hudibras part two canto three verse three hundred and one an opera like a pillory may be said to nail our ears down and expose our head young's satires in the duenna we find this thought differently illustrated by no means imitative though the satire is congenial john jerome alluding to the serenader says these amorous orgies that steal the senses in the hearing as they say egyptian embalmers serve mummies extracting the brain through the ears the wit is original but the subject is the same in three passages the whole turning on the allusion to the head and to the ears when pope composed the following lines on fame how vain that second life in others breath the estate which wits inherit after death ease health and life for this they must resign unsure the tenure but how vast the fine temple of fame he seems to have had present in his mind a single idea of butler by which he has very richly amplified the entire imagery butler says honour is a lease for lives to come and cannot be extended from the legal tenant hudibras part one canto three verse thousand forty three the same thought may be found in sir george mackenzie's essay on preferring solitude to public employment first published in sixteen sixty five Hudibras preceded it by two years. The thought is strongly expressed by the eloquent Mackenzie. Fame is a revenue payable only to our ghosts, and to deny ourselves all present satisfaction, or to expose ourselves to so much hazard for this, were as great madness as to starve ourselves, or fight desperately for food, to be laid on our tombs after our death. Dryden, in his Absalom and Achitophel, says of the Earl of Shaftesbury, David for him his tuneful harp had strung, and heaven had wanted one immortal song. This verse was ringing in the ear of Pope, when with equal modesty and felicity he adopted it in addressing his friend Dr. Arbuthnot. Friend of my life, which did not you prolong, the world had wanted many an idle song. Howell has prefixed to his letters a tedious poem, written in the taste of the times, and he there says of letters that they are the heralds and sweet harbingers that move from east to west on embassies of love they can the tropic cut and cross the line it is probable that pope had noted this thought for the following lines seem a beautiful heightening of the idea heaven first taught letters for some wretch's aid some banished lover or some captive maid then he adds they speed the soft intercourse from soul to soul and waft a sigh from indus to the pole eloisa there is another passage in howell's letters which has a great affinity with the thought of pope who in the rape of the lock says fair tresses man's imperial race and snare and beauty draws us with a single hair howell writes page two hundred and ninety tis a powerful sex they were too strong for the first the strongest and the wisest man that was they must needs be strong when one hair of a woman can draw more than a hundred pair of oxen 
pope's description of the death of the lamb in his essay on man is finished with the nicest touches and is one of the finest pictures our poetry exhibits even familiar as it is to our ear we never examine it but with undiminished admiration the lamb thy riot dooms to bleed to-day had he thy reason would he skip and play pleased to the last he crops the flowery food and licks the hand just raised to shed his blood after pausing on the last two fine verses will not the reader smile that i should conjecture the image might originally have been discovered in the following humble verses in a poem once considered not as contemptible a gentle lamb has rhetoric to plead and when she sees the butcher's knife decreed her voice entreats him not to make her bleed dr king's mully of mount town this natural and affecting image might certainly have been observed by pope without his having perceived it through the less polished lens of the telescope of dr king it is however a similarity though it may not be an imitation and is given as an example of that art in composition which can ornament the humblest conception like the graceful vest thrown over naked and sordid beggary i consider the following lines as strictly copied by thomas wharton the daring artist explored the pangs that rent the royal breast those wounds that lurk beneath the tissued vest thomas wharton on shakespeare sir philip sidney in his defence of poesy has the same image he writes tragedy openeth the greatest wounds and showeth forth the ulcers that are covered with tissue the same appropriation of thought will attach to the following lines of tickle while the charmed reader with thy thought complies and views thy rosamond with henry's eyes tickle to addison evidently from the french horace en vain contre les sites un ministre se ligue tout paris pour chimène a les yeux de rodrigue boileau oldham the satirist says in his satires upon the jesuits that had cain been of this black fraternity he had not been content with a quarter of mankind had he been jesuit had he but put on their savage cruelty the rest had gone satire too doubtless at that moment echoed in his poetical ear the energetic and caustic epigram of andrew marvel against blood stealing the crown dressed in a parson's cassock and sparing the life of the keeper with the priest's vestment had he but put on the prelate's cruelty the crown had gone the following passages seem echoes to each other and it is but justice due to oldham the satirist to acknowledge him as the parent of this antithesis on butler who can think without just rage the glory and the scandal of the age satire against poetry it seems evidently borrowed by pope when he applies the thought to erasmus at length erasmus the great injured name the glory of the priesthood and the shame young remembered the antithesis when he said of some for glory such the boundless rage that they're the blackest scandal of the age voltaire a great reader of pope seems to have borrowed part of the expression scandale d'eglise et des rois le modèle de Caux, an old french poet in one of his moral poems on an hourglass inserted in modern collections has many ingenious thoughts that this poem was read and admired by goldsmith the following beautiful image seems to indicate de co comparing the world to his hourglass says beautifully c'est un verre qui lui qu'un souffle peut détruire et qu'un souffle a produit goldsmith applies the thought very happily princes and lords may flourish or may fade a breath can make them as a breath has made i do not know whether we might not read for modern copies are sometimes incorrect a breath unmakes them as a breath has made thompson in his pastoral story of palamon and lavinia appears to have copied a passage from otway palamon thus addresses lavinia o oh, let me now into a richer soil transplant thee safe where vernal suns and showers diffuse their warmest largest influence and of my garden be the pride and joy chamon employs the same image when speaking of monimia he says you took her up a little tender flower and with a careful loving hand transplanted her into your own fair garden 
where the sun always shines the origin of the following imagery is undoubtedly grecian but it is still embellished and modified by our best poets while universal pan knit with the graces and the hours in dance let on the eternal spring paradise lost thompson probably caught this strain of imagery sudden to heaven thence weary vision turns where leading soft the silent hours of love with purest ray sweet venus shines summer verse one thousand six hundred ninety two gray in repeating this imagery has borrowed a remarkable epithet from milton lo where the rosy bosomed hours fair venus train appear ode to spring along the crispid shades and bowers revels the spruce and jocund spring the graces and the rosy bosomed hours thither all their bounty spring comus verse nine hundred eighty four collins in his ode to fear whom he associates with danger there grandly personified was i think considerably indebted to the following stanza of spencer next him was fear all armed from top to toe yet thought himself not safe enough thereby but feared each sudden movement to and fro and his own arms when glittering he did spy or clashing heard he fast away did fly as ashes pale of yew and wingy heeled and evermore on danger fixed his eye gainst whom he always bent the brazen shield which his right hand unarmed fearfully did wield fairy queen b three canto twelve stanza twelve warm from its perusal he seems to have seized it as a hint to the ode to fear and in his passions to have very finely copied an idea here first fear his hand his skill to try amid the course bewildered laid and back recoiled he knew not why even at the sound himself had made o to the passions the stanza in beatty's minstrel first book in which his visionary boy after the storm of summer rain views the rainbow brighten to the setting sun and runs to reach it fond fool that deems the streaming glory nigh how vain the chase thine ardour has begun this fled afar ere half thy purposed race be run thus it fares with age etc the same train of thought and imagery applied to the same subject though the image itself be somewhat different may be found in the poems of the platonic john norris a writer who has great originality of thought and a highly poetical spirit his stanza runs thus so to the unthinking boy the distant sky seems on some mountain surface to rely he with ambitious haste climbs the ascent curious to touch the firmament but when with an unwearied pace he is arrived at the long wished for place with sighs the sad defeat he does deplore his heaven is still as distant as before the infidel by john norris in the modern tragedy of the castle spectre is this fine description of the ghost of evelina suddenly a female form glided along the vault i flew towards her my arms were already unclosed to clasp her when suddenly her figure changed her face grew pale a stream of blood gushed from her bosom while speaking her form withered away the flesh fell from her bones a skeleton loathsome and meagre clasped me in her mouldering arms her infected breath was mingled with mine her rotting fingers pressed my hand and my face was covered with her kisses oh then how i trembled with disgust there is undoubtedly singular merit in this description i shall contrast it with one which the french virgil has written in an age whose faith was stronger in ghosts than ours yet which perhaps had less skill in describing them there are some circumstances which seem to indicate that the author of the castle spectre lighted his torch at the altar of the french muse athalia thus narrates her dream in which the spectre of jezebel her mother appears c'est toi pendant l'horreur d'une profonde nuit Ma mère Jézabel devant moi s'est montrée comme au jour de sa mort, pompeusement parée, en achevant ces mots épouvantables. Son ombre vers mon lit apparut se baisser, et moi, je lui tendois les mains pour l'embrasser. Mais je n'ai plus trouvé qu'un horrible mélange d'eau et de chair meurtrie, 
et traîner dans la fange des lambeaux pleins de sang et des membres affreux. Racines Atali, Act Two, Scene Five. Goldsmith, when in his pedestrian tour he sat amidst the Alps, as he paints himself in his traveller, and felt himself the solitary neglected genius he was, desolate amidst the surrounding scenery, probably at that moment applied to himself the following beautiful imagery of Thomson. As in the hollow breast of Apennine, beneath the centre of encircling hills, a myrtle rises far from human eyes, and breathes its balmy fragrance over the wild. Autumn, verse 202. Goldsmith very pathetically applies a similar image. Even now, when alpine solitudes ascend, I sit me down a pensive hour to spend, like yon neglected shrub at random cast that shades the steep and sighs at every blast. Traveller. Akenside illustrates the native impulse of genius by a simile of Memnon's marble statue sounding its lyre at the touch of the sun for as old memnon's image long renowned by fabling nihilus to the quivering touch of titan's ray with each repulsive string consenting sounded through the warbling air unbidden strains even so did nature's hand etc it is remarkable that the same image which does not appear obvious enough to have been the common inheritance of poets is precisely used by old Rignier, the first french satirist in the dedication of his satires to the french king louis XIV supplies the place of nature to the courtly satirist these are his words on lit qu'en Éthiope, il y a voit une statue qui rend doit un son harmonieux toutes les fois que le soleil levant la regardoit ce même miracle sire avez-vous fait en moi qui touché de l'astre de votre majesté et reçu la voix et la parole in that sublime passage in pope's essay on man epistola one verse two hundred thirty seven beginning vast chain of being which from god began and proceeds to from nature's chain whatever link you strike tenth or ten thousandth breaks the chain alike pope seems to have caught the idea and image from waller whose last verse is as fine as any in the essay on man the chain that's fixed to the throne of jove on which the fabric of our world depends one link dissolved the whole creation ends of the danger his majesty escaped etc verse one hundred sixty eight it has been observed by thyer that milton borrowed the expression imbrowned and brown which he applies to the evening shade from the italian see thyer's elegant note in b four verse two hundred forty six and where the unpierced shade imbrowned the noontide bowers and b nine verse thousand eighty six where highest woods impenetrable to sun or starlight spread their umbrage broad and brown as evening falim bruno is an expression used by the italians to denote the approach of the evening boiardo ariosto and tasso have made a very picturesque use of this term noticed by thyer i doubt if it be applicable to our colder climate but thomson appears to have been struck by the fine effect it produces in poetical landscape for he has with quickened step brown night retires summer verse fifty one if the epithet be true it cannot be more appropriately applied than in the season he describes which most resembles the genial clime with the deep serenity of an italian heaven milton in italy had experienced the brown evening but it may be suspected that thomson only recollected the language of the poet the same observation may be made on two other poetical epithets i shall notice the epithet laughing applied to inanimate objects and purple to beautiful objects the natives of italy and the softer climates receive emotions from the views of their waters in the spring not equally experienced in the british roughness of our skies the fluency and softness of the water are thus described by lucretius tibi suava is daida latellus submitted flores tibi rident aequora ponti inelegantly rendered by creech the roughest sea puts on smooth looks and smiles dryden more happily the ocean smiles and smooths her wavy breast but metastasio has copied lucretius a te fioriscono gli erbosi prat e i flutti ridono nel mar placati 
it merits observation that the northern poets could not exalt their imagination higher than that the water smiled while the modern italian having before his eyes a different spring found no difficulty in agreeing with the ancients that the waves laughed modern poetry has made a very free use of the animating epithet laughing gray has laughing flowers and langhorne in two beautiful lines personifies flora where tweed's soft banks in liberal beauty lie and flora laughs beneath an azure sky sir william jones in the spirit of oriental poetry has the laughing air dryden has employed this epithet boldly in the delightful lines almost entirely borrowed from his original chaucer the morning lark the messenger of day saluted in her song the morning gray and soon the sun arose with beams so bright that all the horizon laughed to see the joyous sight palamon and arcite b two footnote the old poet is the most fresh and powerful in his words the passage is thus given in wright's edition the busy lark messenger of day saluteth in her song the morrow gray and fiery phoebus rises up so bright that all the orient laugheth of the light lee hunt remarks with justice that dryden falls short of the freshness and feeling of the sentiment his lines are beautiful but they do not come home to us with so happy and cordial a face End of footnote. it is extremely difficult to conceive what the ancients precisely meant by the word purpureus they seem to have designed by it anything bright and beautiful a classical friend has furnished me with numerous significations of this word which are very contradictory albinovanus in his elegy on livia mentions nivem purpureum catullus quercus ramus purpureus horus purpureo bibet ore nectar and somewhere mentions olores purpureos virgil has purpuream vomit ille animam and homer calls the sea purple and gives it in some other book the same epithet when in a storm the general idea however has been fondly adopted by the finest writers in europe the purple of the ancients is not known to us what idea therefore have the moderns affixed to it edison in his vision of the temple of fame describes the country as being covered with a kind of purple light gray's beautiful line is well known the bloom of young desire and purple light of love and tasso in describing his hero godfrey says heaven li empie d'onor la faccia e vi riduce di giovinezza il bel purpureo lume both gray and tasso copied virgil where venus gives to her son aeneas lumen quel juventae purpureum dryden has omitted the purple light in his version nor is it given by pitt but dryden expresses the general idea by with hands divine had formed his curling locks and made his temples shine and given his rolling eyes a sparkling grace it is probable that milton has given us his idea of what was meant by this purple light when applied to the human countenance in the felicitous expression of celestial rosy red gray appears to me to be indebted to milton for a hint for the opening of his elegy as in the first line he had dante and milton in his mind he perhaps might also in the following passage have recollected a congenial one in comus which he altered milton describing the evening marks it out by what time the laboured ox in his loose traces from the furrow came and the swinged hedger at his supper set gray has the lowing herd winds slowly over the lee the ploughman homeward plods his weary way wharton has made an observation on this passage in comus and observes further that it is a classical circumstance but not a natural one in an english landscape for our ploughmen quit their work at noon i think therefore the imitation is still more evident and as wharton observes both gray and milton copied here from books and not from life there are three great poets who have given us a similar incident dryden introduces the highly finished picture of the hare in his annus mirabilis stanza one hundred thirty one so i have seen some fearful hare maintain a course till tired before the dog she lay who stretched behind her pants upon the plain past power to kill as she to get away one hundred thirty two with his lolled tongue he faintly licks his prey his warm breath blows her flicks up as she lies 
she trembling creeps upon the ground away and looks back to him with beseeching eyes thompson paints the stag in a similar situation fainting breathless toil sick seizes on his heart he stands at bay the big round tears run down his dappled face he groans in anguish autumn verse four hundred fifty one shakespeare exhibits the same object the wretched animal heaved forth such groans that their discharge did stretch his leathern coat almost to bursting and the big round tears coursed one another down his innocent nose in piteous chase of these three pictures the beseeching eyes of dryden perhaps is more pathetic than the big round tears certainly borrowed by thomson from shakespeare because the former expression has more passion and is therefore more poetical the sixth line in dryden is perhaps exquisite for its imitative harmony and with peculiar felicity paints the action itself thomson adroitly drops the innocent nose of which one word seems to have lost its original signification and the other offends now by its familiarity the dappled face is a term more picturesque more appropriate and more poetically expressed End of section 26. Section 26 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Literature volume two by isaac desraeli explanation of the facsimile the manuscripts of pope's version of the iliad and odyssey are preserved in the british museum in three volumes the gift of david mallet they are written chiefly on the backs of letters amongst which are several from addison steele gervais rowe young carl walsh sir godfrey kneller fenton craggs congreve hughes his mother editha and Lito and tonson the booksellers footnote this use of what most persons would consider waste paper obtained for the poet the designation of paper sparing pope end of footnote from these letters no information can be gathered which merits public communication they relate generally to the common civilities and common affairs of life. What little could be done has already been given in the additions to Pope's works. It has been observed that Pope taught himself to write by copying printed books. Of this singularity we have in this collection a remarkable instance. Several parts are written in Roman and Italic characters, which for some time I mistook for print. No imitation can be more correct. What appears on this facsimile I have printed to assist its deciphering, and I have also subjoined the passage as it was given to the public for immediate reference. The manuscript from whence this page is taken consists of the first rude sketches, an intermediate copy having been employed for the press, so that the corrected verses of this facsimile occasionally vary from those published. This passage has been selected because the parting of Hector and Andromache is perhaps the most pleasing episode in the Iliad, while it is confessedly one of the most finished passages. The lover of poetry will not be a little gratified when he contemplates the variety of epithets, the imperfect idea, the gradual embellishment, and the critical erasures which are here discovered. Footnote. Dr. Johnson, in noticing the manuscript of Milton, preserved to Cambridge, has made, with his usual force of language, the following observation, quote, Such relics show how excellence is acquired. What we hope ever to do with ease, we may learn first to do with diligence. End, quote. End of footnote. The action of Hector, in lifting his infant in his arms, occasioned Pope much trouble, and at length the printed copy has a different reading. I must not omit noticing 
that the whole is on the back of a letter franked by addison which cover i have given at one corner of the plate the parts distinguished by italics were rejected thus having spoke the illustrious chief of troy extends his eager arms to embrace his boy lovely stretched his fond arms to seize the beauteous boy babe the boy clung crying to his nurse's breast scared at the dazzling helm and nodding crest each kind with silent pleasure the fond parent smiled and hector hastened to relieve his child the glittering terrors unbound his radiant helmet from his brows unbraced on the ground he and on the ground the glittering terror placed beamy and placed the radiant helmet on the ground then seized the boy and raising him in air lifting then fondling in his arms his infant heir dancing thus to the gods addressed a father's prayer glory fills o thou whose thunder shakes thy ethereal throne deathless and all ye other powers protect my son like mine this war blooming youth with every virtue blessed grace the shield and glory of the trojan race like mine his valor and his just renown like mine his labors to defend the crown grant him like me to purchase just renown the trojans to guard my country to defend the crown in arms like me his country's war to wage and rise the hector of the future age against his country's foes the war to wage and rise the hector of the future age successful so when triumph from the glorious toils of heroes slain he bears the reeking spoils whole hosts may all troy shall hail him with deserved acclaim own the sun and cry this chief transcends his father's fame while pleased amidst the general shouts of troy his mother's conscious heart o'erflows with joy fondly on her he said and gazing o'er his consort's charms restored his infant to her longing arms on soft in her fragrant breast the babe she laid pressed to her heart and with a smile surveyed to repose hushed him to rest and with a smile surveyed passion but soon the troubled pleasure mixed with rising fears dashed with fear the tender pleasure soon chastised by fear she mingled with the smile a tender tear the passage appears thus in the printed work i have marked in italics the variations thus having spoke the illustrious chief of troy stretched his fond arms to clasp the lovely boy the babe clung crying to his nurse's breast scared at the dazzling helm and nodding crest with secret pleasure each fond parent smiled footnote silent in the manuscript observes a critical friend is greatly superior to secret as it appears in the printed work End of footnote. and hector hasted to relieve his child the glittering terrors from his brows unbound and placed the beaming helmet on the ground then kissed the child and lifting high in air thus to the gods preferred a father's prayer o thou whose glory fills the ethereal throne and all ye deathless powers protect my son grant him like me to purchase just renown to guard the trojans to defend the crown against his country's foes the war to wage and rise the hector of the future age so when triumphant from successful toils of heroes slain he bears the reeking spoils whole hosts may hail him with deserved acclaim and say this chief transcends his father's fame while pleased amidst the general shouts of troy his mother's conscious heart o'erflows with joy he spoke and fondly gazing on her charms restored the pleasing burden to her arms soft on her fragrant breast the babe she laid hushed to repose 
and with a smile surveyed the troubled pleasure soon chastised by fear she mingled with the smile of a tender tear end of section twenty six recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section twenty seven of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jason in panama curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli literary fashions there is such a thing as literary fashion and prose and verse have been regulated by the same caprice that cuts our coats and cocks our hats dr kippis who had a taste for literary history has observed that dodsley's economy of human life long received the most extravagant applause from the supposition that it was written by a celebrated nobleman an instance of the power of literary fashion the history of which as it hath appeared in various ages and countries and as it hath operated with respect to the different objects of science learning art and taste would form a work that might be highly instructive and entertaining the favourable reception of dodsley's economy of human life produced a whole family of economies it was soon followed by a second part the gratuitous ingenuity of one of those officious imitators whom an original author never cares to thank other economies trod on the heels of each other for some memoranda towards a history of literary fashions the following may be arranged at the restoration of letters in europe commentators and compilers were at the head of the literati translators followed who enriched themselves with their spoils on the commentators when in the progress of modern literature writers aimed to rival the great authors of antiquity the different styles in their servile imitations clashed together and parties were formed who fought desperately for the style they chose to adopt the public were long harassed by a fantastic race who called themselves ciceronian of whom are recorded many ridiculous practices to strain out the words of cicero into their hollow verbosities they were routed by the facetious erasmus then followed the brilliant era of epigrammatic points and good sense and good taste were nothing without the spurious ornaments of false wit another age was deluged by a million of sonnets and volumes were for a long time read without their readers being aware that their patience was exhausted there was an age of epics which probably can never return again for after two or three the rest can be but repetitions with a few variations in italy from fifteen thirty to fifteen eighty a vast multitude of books were written on love the fashion of writing on that subject for certainly it was not always a passion with the indefatigable writer was an epidemical distemper they wrote like pedants and pagans those who could not write their love in verse diffused themselves in prose when the polyphilus of colonna appeared which is given in the form of a dream this dream made a great many dreamers as it happens in company says the sarcastic zeno when one yawner makes many yawn when bishop hall first published his satires he called them toothless satires but his latter ones he distinguished as biting satires many good-natured men who could only write good-natured verse crowded in his footsteps and the abundance of their labours only showed that even the toothless satires of hall could bite more sharply than those of servile imitators after spencer's fairy queen was published the press overflowed with many mistaken imitations in which fairies were the chief actors this circumstance is humorously animadverted on by marston in his satires as quoted by wharton every scribe now falls asleep and in his dreams straight ten pound to one outsteps some fairy awakes straight rubs his eyes and prints his tail the great personage who gave a fashion to this class of literature was the courtly and romantic elizabeth herself 
her obsequious wits and courtiers would not fail to feed and flatter her taste whether they all felt the beauties or languished over the tediousness of the fairy queen and the arcadia of sydney at least her majesty gave a vogue to such sentimental and refined romance the classical elizabeth introduced another literary fashion having translated the hercules Oedicus, she made it fashionable to translate greek tragedies there was a time in the age of fanaticism and the long parliament that books were considered the more valuable for their length the seventeenth century was the age of folios carroll wrote commentary on job in two volumes folio of above one thousand two hundred sheets as it was intended to inculcate the virtue of patience these volumes gave at once the theory and the practice one is astonished at the multitude of the divines of this age whose works now lie buried under the brick and mortar tombs of four or five folios which on a moderate calculation might now be wire woven into thirty or forty modern octavos in charles the first's time love and honour were heightened by the wits into florid romance but lord goring turned all into ridicule and he was followed by the duke of buckingham whose happy vein of ridicule was favoured by charles the second who gave it the vogue it obtained sir william temple justly observes that changes in veins of wit are like those of habits or other modes on the return of charles the second none were more out of fashion among the new courtiers than the old earl of norwich who was esteemed the greatest wit in his father's time among the old modern times have abounded with what may be called fashionable literature tragedies were some years ago as fashionable as comedies are at this day thomas mallet francis hill applied their genius to a department in which they lost it all footnote the great feature of the modern stage within the last twenty years has been the classical burlesque drama which though originating in the last century in such plays as midas really reached its culmination under the auspices of madame vestris End of footnote. declamation and rant and over-refined language were preferred to the fable the manners and to nature and those now sleep on our shelves then too we had a family of paupers in the parish of poetry in imitations of spencer not many years ago churchill was the occasion of deluging the town with political poems in quarto these again were succeeded by narrative poems in the ballad measure from all sizes of poets the castle of otranto was the father of that marvellous which once overstocked the circulating library and closed with mrs radcliffe lord byron has been the father of hundreds of graceless sons travels and voyages have long been a class of literature so fashionable that we began to prepare for or to dread the arrival of certain persons from the continent different times then are regulated by different tastes what makes a strong impression on the public at one time ceases to interest it at another an author who sacrifices to the prevailing humours of his day has but little chance of being esteemed by posterity and every age of modern literature might perhaps admit a new classification by dividing it into its periods of fashionable literature end of section twenty seven